Hello everyone. Today I'm super excited because I'm doing an interview with the Dr. T. Colin Campbell. Dr. Campbell is a pioneering biochemist, author of over 300 research papers and three books, most notably the China study. He's also the founder of the T. Colin Campbell Center of Nutrition Studies. Welcome. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. It's an absolute pleasure uh, speaking to you. Um, you have really inspired me and I'm sure millions of other people who went uh, plant-based. Um, so, and I mean, let's, let's talk about the China study. Can you just give us a quick overview of what the study was all about? Uh, the major part of the book is actually the research I was doing for decades before the China study, you know, in the laboratory. Mm, okay, okay. That's work that started in, in the Philippines, that did work back home and so forth and so on. And I had uh, begun to learn something about the, the science of nutrition during those times uh, that was really kind of outside the box. Mm. Uh, and so I was anxious to, uh, to do this, uh, to have a look at uh, this information in, in a human population. That's where the, the China study came in. So we had this marvelous opportunity mm. of doing it in China. In collaboration, I must just say, with University of Oxford, uh, Chinese colleagues and others. I was interested to see if what we were learning in the laboratory from a theoretical sense in, in a way, whether that corresponded to what we might see with the human population, and it did. It was actually one of the, the biggest nutrition studies ever conducted. Yes, it was called the most comprehensive study ever conducted. Yeah, that's absolutely incredible. Um, so what are the main findings of, of this study? Well, what I came into the study with was uh, this information we had that uh, the consumption of uh, animal-based protein was not a very good idea. But I, I saw some information that the animal protein turns on cancer experimentally, it, it does some other things. And so when we came to the China study, uh, I was aware of that information. I wanted to kind of check it out because in rural China, they don't consume much animal-based protein. In fact, the total protein consumed is rather low compared to Western countries. Mm. And I just wanted to see what did we see. We, we had the opportunity in China of comparing uh, dietary practices, especially the consumption of animal-based foods, to compare that with a number of different disease mortality rates, the various cancers and eventually some other diseases. Uh, what happens with these diseases as the consumption of animal protein goes down? Mm. And uh, in my case, or in this case, um, it was consistent with what we were looking at in the laboratory, remarkable. As yeah. soon as we start putting animal food in the diet, we begin to incur risk of all kinds for different diseases, cancer included, of course. Okay. Um, and so that was a big deal, but it was more than that. It, it was uh, yeah, when we do, when we consume animal-based foods, we tend to decrease the consumption of plant-based foods. Okay. It's a whole, it's a whole shebang. Yeah. So, um, I mean, because, you know, you, you hear the arguments uh, that there's, there are lots of nutrients in, in animal-based uh, foods and stuff like that. So if we don't eat those um, animal-based products, uh, we might lack nutrients like iron, um, calcium, for example, or other things. So what's your opinion on that? Do we, do we, is it worth getting the nutrients from animal um, protein or? No, actually, plant-based foods mm. provide all the protein we need. We don't need animal foods for getting the animal protein. That's an old idea. Mm. It's a very prominent idea, obviously. It's very old. Uh, but we don't need the animal foods for the protein. We get all the iron and all the, obviously, the fiber and, and other minerals, for example, that we need. Mm. From foods. In fact, the amount we get from plant-based foods in that form is superior. Uh, I mean, and... One thing I found really astounding, so uh, I've seen you in a, um, a TV show, and that was in the 80s, and you talked about the, the findings of your studies. And, um, you know, people were quite interested uh, in, in what you had to say as well. And now, more than 30 years later, um, science, or I mean, like nutrition still hasn't really changed that much. I mean, that's, that's, that's incredible. I mean, how, how did that happen? What's your opinion on this? Well, it's been part of, I mean, much of my career was a challenge, I have to say, yeah. because I was winning against the grain, let's face it. It's hard to change, mm. really, really hard to change. We are, in the Western countries, we are accustomed to consuming, let's say, the Western diet, which is rich yeah. in animal-based foods. That's, that's just the nature of the beast, uh, no pun intended. But in any case, um, you can imagine the kind of pushback I get, first from the livestock industry, yeah. Yeah. secondly, from the, the pharmaceutical industry, and third, from uh, 
health organizations, more so in the US and the UK. One of the most popular recipes on my blog, actually, vegan cheese recipes. Um, so how come, I think it's especially with dairy as well, how come it's so hard for people to give up dairy? Well, I know that very well personally and professionally uh, because I was raised on a farm. Mm. I grew up milking cows. And so I drank lots of milk, a lot of meat, eggs and so forth and so on. I mean, that was my life uh, and, as well as my family's, of course. And so uh, when I got into the research, I had to start thinking about that seriously. You know, is, it, do, is this for real or not? So that was really what generated a lot of the research that we did, trying to prove or disprove that idea. What I learned along the way, and it's just not me, as many others too, is that if we change the diet, and let's say we go whole hog, I'm sorry if you're using that pun, but if, if we go whole hog uh, the whole way, uh, it's not very it's, it's not very exciting in the beginning okay but you know if we stay with it for a, a month or two our bodies begin to change our preferences for food begins to change taste preferences my point is this our bodies adjust to this new food very nicely and you'll get to a point where you do, uh, I, you can't figure out why you ever ate that food you know, before i that was made how long have you been actually on a on a on a plant-based diet? My wife and I started this in 1978. Wow! So yeah, an idea. Well, just a bit at a time. We first started eating more salads, but mm. that meant chicken salad and tuna salad. To be honest about it, but then we dropped red meat in the next three or four years, and then we began to we use chicken that that was said to be better, but then I learned that's not true either. Mm. Uh, so uh, eventually we dropped dairy. That was kind of hard for me because, as I said, I drank lots of milk and ate a lot of cheese. And, but uh, interesting enough, the same thing happened. I lost my taste for it. So you started so, like 41 years ago with a plant-based diet. Yeah, actually, I should say that my I started my professional research career yeah. 63 years ago. Okay, wow. <laughs> so I I was already in the game. Yeah, yeah. For quite a long time before I started seeing this information. But but now, I mean. So many years later, you are very healthy. Uh, you exercise for at least one hour, one and a half hours a day. Um, I mean, how do you do it? Uh, may, I, may I say, how old are you? Are you 85 now? Yes, I'm 85 and my yeah. wife is 78 and we don't use any drugs. Yeah, that's and none, none of our family, we have 22 members of our family, children, uh, spouses and grandchildren. None of us use drugs. So how do you how do you stay how do you stay fit on a plant based diet? Like what do you do? Does it does it help you? Do you think? Well, yeah, you without a, without a doubt. I mean, yeah. I I find it quite amazing because as I say, I'm an experiment unto unto myself because I I went through the same thing. Mm. Uh, but basically, I jogged for a lot of years. I played golf, I, and on a regular basis, uh, and I like jogging. You have a very active lifestyle and. Yes. Um, you, you you work a lot and you're actually writing a new book as well, which is very exciting. Um, so what's what's this new book about? Well, the new book is sort of the capstone. I wrote the first book, The China Study, if you will. Yeah. Uh, that turned out to be quite successful. It's been translated, incidentally, now into 48 foreign languages. That together with the uh, cookbooks that go with it, which have done for well, and also the second book, we've sold probably close to 5 million copies. Wow, okay. And so, um, and the China study was basically an attempt to just write down what I thought I had come to know. My youngest son worked with me, a great writer. He's now a physician. He's now running a research program of his own on, on women with breast cancer, for example. But in any case, we, we came out with that, just pretty, pretty good luck with that. And then I wrote a second book, Whole, which has got into more of the theoretical arguments. Um, that's going over quite well. It was a New York Times bestseller. This third book, it's actually, uh, in a sense, uh, uh, almost like an afterword. Well, you know, what did all this mean? And so it's really about my career. Okay, okay. During my career, I was very much involved in policy development, mm -hmm. well research and lecturing and so forth. And I've seen this story from many different perspectives. And uh, so this second book is actually going back and say, here's what I learned in history. Here, I think, is where we made a mistake. Here's where we took mm -hmm. the wrong fork in the road. Back in the 1800s, especially on the history of cancer research, there were two theories as to what cancer is. One theory said it was a constitutional disease, mm -hmm. a whole body kind of thing, you know, lots of things operating to create that disease. 
The second was uh, called the local theory of disease. That was pushed by the surgeons. Later, it was pushed by the uh, chemotherapists and the radiation therapists. Okay. The, the idea there was, let's take care of this nasty disease by doing very specific things at mm -hmm. a local level. And so that was, that's what gave rise to what we now use, which is unfortunately in very sad shape. So, but you're also um, teaching other people uh, about nutrition as well. Um, so you have the T. Colin Campbell Center for Nutrition Studies uh, you founded. Can, can you tell us a little bit more about that and what's, what's in store uh, for us in the future? Uh, and later in my career, I had the opportunity of teaching vegetarian nutrition. I, I didn't like the name much, but yeah. it attracted yeah. some interest. I taught that course for a little bit. It was very popular with the students. Uh, and suddenly, the chairman of the department pulled it out of the catalog without my consent. That led to a big row. Uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, and, and on, and because he was a big policymaker in Washington. So it became a big story, not just on the campus for me, but actually in a national sense. I wanted to keep doing the course. I wanted to offer the course so others could use it through the internet at that time. Mm -hmm and the internet would just come into play. So I had a bunch of students, enthusiastic students, wanted to stay on and work with me and do whatever they could to put that online. Three to 5,000 students signed a petition that has the, the course restored. Wow, okay. And that didn't work. The administration said, no, we don't want that here because the administration sold out to the dairy industry. Wow, that's, that's quite a pushback you, you got there. It's a, huge, a huge pushback. You wouldn't believe what we took the course uh, then, uh, thanks to the students who worked with me, and we created a, I had a non-profit organization of sorts, mm -hmm. of course, and then they helped to put it online. Now we've had this online course now developed in a much more sophisticated way, I think. We have this course that uh, we've had more than 20,000 graduates. Wow. You know, and uh, it's, a, it's a unique kind of course. It, uh, and we're partnering, incidentally, I'm, we're partnering with an extremely important partner. It's mm -hmm. the online course program of Cornell University. Okay, okay. That, that's a private entity. They run their own shop. And so we partner with them. They've been wonderful partners. Mm -hmm. We've had a tremendous experience with this course, and now we're expanding it into, we have another whole certificate program coming out in food and the environment. I, I can tell you from my, my own enthusiasm for this, as well as many others, is that the environmental issue is serious. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and we, the biggest contributor to the environmental problem is the food we eat. It's that simple. Mm. I spoke before the United Nations group in Rome about this, yeah. FAO, as well as the European Parliament, by the way. I think the environmental issue right now needs to be stopped. It needs to be understood and we need to get busy correcting it. I know, I know. I think there's, there's you know, so more and more evidence coming out now. And uh, I, there was a paper recently from the United Nations talking about uh, the influence of uh, animal products on our, uh, not just the diet, but our climate as well and stuff. So um, yeah, it's it's really important that we actually um, all get started and get together. So I think it's it's about rethinking how how we look at nutrition and and um, and you know what's important to us, whether it's convenience or whether we can create a more sustainable future. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And so that's that's why I, I noticed a lot as well over the last one or two years, uh, more and more people are actually interested in plant-based nutrition. And uh, so I, I have a recipe blog and uh, I've, I've got a few of my followers actually have a few questions and they're quite excited about uh, this interview as well. Um, and so one of them, uh, Stephanie, was asking, how much protein do we really need? Uh, the first thing I, I, I would say, I don't like numbers. Yeah. Very much. Uh, because they've become sort of uh, black and white kinds of uh, issues. Uh, and, and that's not the way to look at it. For decades, we've assumed that protein more or less comes from animals, let's say. Yeah. And that's why we have to eat animals. Well, that's a circular argument. It's not true. Because if you have a mixed uh, amount of different kinds of plant foods, cereals, grains, legumes, and so forth, we get all the protein we need. Mm. And that's somewhere north of 10% uh, of calories. We can consume up to... 15, 20 percent maybe from plants. It's a little yeah. hard. We, but that that's no harm because oh. the protein, when consumed in that form, is being consumed with everything else, mm. which so, protects. I mean, <coughs> yeah. So you mean we we shouldn't really worry about it? And now there's a lot of professional athletes that are beginning to look at this and getting excited about it. Mm. I'm, I'm talking about the, the the top of the top athletes yeah. Yeah. who are trying this and what they're finding out is that they do have better performance. 
and they certainly have better health after their uh, playing careers are over. There was in the early 1900s, some absolutely excellent research on athletes. With in the respect, already. Yes, with respect to this kind of diet. And they outperformed, they outperformed those who continued to eat animal-based food by a bunch. Wow. And of course, they ended up with, but all that was ignored. Yeah. And the reason it was ignored because no one wanted to hear, certainly authorities, did not want to hear anything mm. uh, negative about animal-based protein. Mm. That's part of my story in the book. That yeah. and that and others like that. So, I mean, the, the more and more people coming out there now um, saying how benefic beneficial uh, a plant-based diet has been for them. Um, so one, one of my other followers, Diane, um, she's a 13-year uh, ovarian cancer survivor. And she, she said she used to eat a lot of um, dairy um, before a cancer um, uh, diagnosis. And then after that, she stopped eating dairy, uh, went to the whole food plant-based diet. And she says her friends are actually saying she looks younger than before. So. <laughs> She wants to know, um, is, uh, is a whole food plant besides uh, a fountain of youth, in your opinion? Yeah, may maybe. I I've thought of that too. I mean, uh, I, I don't want to use those words, it's a little bit presumptuous. <laughs> well, it's not scientific, but... <laughs> yeah, but none nonetheless, I mean, it sort of looks, almost looks that way. Uh, I, I find that the body's ability to manage its affairs and stay healthy <laughs> is, are, is truly amazing. It's mm. like many symphonies, you know, working together in a sense to create. All it needs to have is the right resources. Yeah. And that turns out to come from whole whole plant-based foods. Mm. Not not the process, the whole stuff. Yeah. So um, you're obviously a biochemist, a scientist, um, but do you actually get excited about food? Do you have a, so <laughs> Rachel would like to know what's your, uh, the best vegan food you ever had or what's your favorite vegan food? Um, for breakfast, I don't have the bacon and eggs I used to yeah. have. I, I loved it. That's not the issue. Uh, but I discovered, of course, that just having a bowl of, uh, uh, you call it porridge, but, you know, uh, mm. uh, cereal of some sort, hot, cold, um, and uh, with fruit. And it's, it almost sounds monotonous. I guess it is to some extent. But once you get into it, that's what, that's what I like. Yeah. So lunchtime, uh, I'll have a salad. Usually my wife makes a variety of salads. Uh, and keeps the oil out of it. The added oil is another issue. Mm. Uh, I should say. So, what about salt? Actually, Just uh, salt has been that's, that's been debated for many years, as you know, I'm sure. Um, and there was a story back in uh, when was it? About the 60s and 70s. Mm -hmm. to people who over consumed salt uh, were also uh, had a higher risk of hypertension, mm -hmm. high blood pressure, which wasn't a good thing. Some research was done on that, and eventually that turned out to be that about 20% of us are rather more sensitive to salt uh, than the other 80%. So we have to first sort of have some idea of whether we're sensitive or not. Mm. Uh, that's kind of guided the conversation for many, many years, that sensitivity to salt. Uh, you can just salt to taste. Yeah. Taste. Yeah. Okay. That's not, and you know, you can, we, can, uh, we can get addicted to it, that's for sure. Salt to taste, I think, is the best answer. Okay, and then one uh, last one from James. He would like to know what tips would you give someone just starting out on a plant-based diet? Well, there's two, tra two tracks. Some people want to dive right in, do it straight mm -hmm. off, fine, that's great. Yeah, that was me. <laughs> and uh, others uh, want to do it gradually. Yeah. If they want to do it gradually, then uh, you can start uh, dropping one food at a time. Mm -hmm. I would suggest that one of the first foods to drop is dairy. Dropping dairy is probably the first thing, and dropping uh, meat, of course. And I'm talking about all meat, not just red meat versus white meat. I'm talking about meat mm -hmm. in general. The, when you finally get the whole way, and, and oh yeah, one final thing. The so final step, do not add oil back to all this. Okay. Uh, sugar. You know, try to keep that out. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you can use high, high fat plant-based foods to, cre to create that kind of taste, if you like. Nuts is a good example. Avocado, mm -hmm. coconut, and that sort of thing. That's, that's good stuff. Uh, as long as it's a whole food type. So then you finally get to the place where your tastes have changed. You start saying to yourself, where, where, have, been, where have I been? And you, and you feel this uh, improvement in one's health. Mm. In a lot of cases, reversal of serious diseases. That, that's a big deal. Yeah. So like a quick summary. So like what are the main diseases you can um, either um, 
you know, protect yourself from or, you know, reverse even. Well, um, let me say, say something here I think is going to be uh, very much a part of the future. In fact, it is now to some extent. This diet is not just about preventing future problems. This is a means of treatment. Mm. I, and I know in this case, I'm really using that wording. I'm treading on the toes mm -hmm. of our clin clinical, medical clinical colleagues. One can actually with diabetes, especially heart disease, these sorts of ailments, a lot of autoimmune diseases too. If people who have these kind of difficulties, if they go on this whole food plant-based diet, and in those cases, I'd say they should be 100%. Do it, do it for 10 days even, 20, 30 days. One can see amazing effects in that period of time. Drugs, all the pills and procedures in the world combined cannot come close to this. Hmm. That's that's so, uh, quite a big statement, yeah. It is, it's a major statement, but I'm going to defend it. And I've spoken yeah. before with pharmaceutical groups livestock groups and the rest of it I, I say the same thing and i say if you don't believe me just try it Th you know throw all my words out the window if you want to <laughs> just just try it for yourself yeah and, uh it, it just works and i think that's the future of this movement it's not about uh preventive medicine that's an old word it's been a word that's been uh, kind of uh, denigrated i think mm -hmm. i'm going to say this is a fact of nature it can be used to make ourselves well now. That means treatment. At the same time, it's the same kind of food is what prevents us from having those kind of problems in the first place. Mm. So it's a, you know, it's a whole worldview, if you will, yeah. in many ways. I think this is absolutely amazing. And uh, you're giving hope to uh, a lot of people. Um, so I'm, I'm very grateful for, for you to have done all this research and keep, uh, keep going strong and stuff. Uh, and yeah, thank you so much for, for this interview. Uh, it was a pleasure talking to you. And um, so, yeah, if you'd like to find out more about Dr. T. Campbell's work, head over to the T. Colin Campbell Center for Nutrition Studies website. It's nutritionstudies.org or go to exceedingvegan.com. <laughs>